to it. This is Sean Fraser. Um, he's from the University of Maine. He's going to be talking about the importance of woody debris dynamics and understanding the forest carbon cycle. So, please take it. Yep. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Casey. So you folks realize it's a Deadwood session right after lunch, right? How is this, how is this possibly going to work, right? So I want to begin by acknowledging my collaborators on this project. That would be um, Chris Woodall from the Northern Research Station out of Durham, New Hampshire, uh, Tony D'Amato from here at uh, University of Vermont, and Jody Forrester at North Carolina State University. <clears throat> so I'm used to walking a bit as I talk. I don't know if I should do that here. But so I'm at the University of Maine. I've been there now five and a half years. So I interviewed for this position about six years ago. And some members of the faculty were concerned and were skeptical of the fact that I work on dead things and work on decomposition. So I'm paraphrasing a question I heard quite a bit during that interview process, why should we care about rotting logs on the forest floor? So I'm going to start with that question, OK? Uh, this is a diagram of the forest carbon cycle. There's a lot of information here. I just want to focus on a few fluxes. The fluxes are shown in white arrows. If you look at the CO2 released from the process of decomposition, this is decomposition of all plant material, or all organic material, it's about 60 gigatons per year, right? That's not just dead wood. Again, that's all organic material. If you look at the emissions from human activities, mostly burning of fossil fuel, it's about nine gigatons per year. That is to say, the CO2 re released from heterotrophic respiration is about seven times higher than that um, emitted from human activities. So my answer to that, why should we care if for no other reason this process is important in the global carbon cycle? Let's take a closer look at the forest carbon cycle, right? And specifically, let's look at knowledge gaps in the forest carbon cycle. So I'm showing two opposing forces here in the upper image carbon storage and carbon sequestration. So what are we talking about? Bringing in CO2, as you folks know, from the atmosphere, incorporating it into plant tissue, right? Decomposition is that process in reverse. So here, in the presence of wood decay fungi, those carbohydrates are broken down and CO2 is released. But the thing is, I argue that we know far much more about this process than we do about this one. And one reason is that this has a lot of economic interest, right? And this may be less so, I hate to say, right? So as evidence for that, if we look at our models, right, we have a large number of growth and yield models. Again, referring to the upper figure, right? We have vegetation dynamic models, more models than I can mention, far less knowledge and information about this process. So again, it's. I claim it's a gap in our knowledge about the forest carbon cycle. So let's first talk about carbon storage in deadwood, right? So in general, down woody debris, these logs that I'm showing in these pictures, represents about, 50, I'm waving my hands here, 15 to 20 percent of the above ground wood mass, right? This is in an unmanaged forest, an intensely managed forest, this number would be much lower, of course. And also, I think you folks realize this, about 50% of wood mass is actually carbon mass, right? So how are these logs added to the forest floor, right? So here in New England, where stand-replacing disturbances are fairly uncommon, logs are added to the forest floor through pulses of moderate severity disturbance. And this is some work from northern Maine, uh, looking at three old-growth spruce sites one site, another site, another site. I'm not going into the detail of how we reconstruct this disturbance history. We uh, do some detailed work using uh, tree rings. But in doing that, we can reconstruct the canopy damage over time, right? So in that top figure, again, I'm emphasizing, let's not look at the top figure because I can't reach it. Let's look, <laughs> let's look at this one, right? So you see these pulses of disturbance. Here about 50% of the canopy was removed by some disturbance. Another pulse, two decades of quiescence, relatively little disturbance, another pulse, and so forth. So some of these 50% removals might look like this, right? The point is 
the woody debris added in pulses. That's an important point. If you think about the amount, mass, volume, whatever, I'll just say the amount of woody debris on a site at any given time, it's, it's the balance between those additions from disturbance and depletions, depletions from decomposition. Right? If we were in a fire-prone system, depletions would also be um, the result of combustion. Right? So what I'm going to try to do is combine these two, additions and depletions. And this was made possible by a, a paper published by Matt Russell and others, 2014, that documented the mass loss functions for all of our, most of our, uh, at least our common tree species in the eastern United States. Now, some of you folks are probably thinking, didn't we know that, haven't we known that for a long time? Most of the decay curves for our wood species are actually density reductions. We're much less interested in that. We're interested in mass loss. So Matt Russell and others, using some clever modeling, uh, produced these mass loss equations. So I think you see where I'm going with this. I'm going to combine the additions and depletions. And we can reconstruct the mass of coarse woody debris on those three sites that I've been referring to over time. And you can see, if we look at this one, there's a pulse. This is actually from the spruce budworm outbreak. There's a pulse in woody debris. I should say the vertical axis is mass, right, megagrams per hectare. So you see this pulse and then a depletion, minor pulse and so forth. This is another spruce budworm outbreak, right? So this is one method we use to ask the question, what's sort of the range of variability in down woody debris mass over time? Well, here, at least for these sites, we have it. It ranges from about uh, somewhere around 10 megagrams to 45, right? Again, pulses, depletions. Right? This is really difficult to do. Right? This makes it look easy. This was a lot of work, and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. I don't think we're going to try it again. The, the, um, the other downside of this, this is only done retrospectively. This is not part of an experiment. So we might ask, how can we look at wood decomposition in an experimental sense? And here we interview, introduce this concept of decay stakes right, as a research tool. So what we do is fabricate these stakes out of various wood species, fabricate them very precisely. I've got one here in my cargo pocket. This is what they look like. This is sugar maple. We know the exact size because I, I made these things, right? So they've got precise. We know the size, that is the volume. We dry them in an oven, as I'm showing here. We weigh them dry, right? So for each stake, we have the initial dry weight. Each one's uh, uniquely numbered and associated with a tag and they're placed into the forest floor with a landscaping staple, right? So we can monitor these over time. So this is some of our work. Tony D'Amato's involved in this and Jody Forrester in the Lake States, right? So these particular stakes were deployed in the year 2010 with planned collection in 2012, 2014, 16, and 18, right? So that's how it works. This photograph shows four stakes. We actually combined, we have about 2,000 of these things scattered around Minnesota, Wisconsin, New Hampshire, and Maine. And some of those have already been collected. So we were real clever, we thought, to put a whisker flag here, right? See that yellow flag? So we could easily find those when we go back to the site. <laughs> but two years later, the sites looked like this, right? So we actually had a lot of trouble finding these. We found almost all of them, though, no. right? So again, what we do, collect them, as I've shown here clean them off, dry them in the oven, weigh them. So for each stake, we get mass loss, right? This is making sense. So let's look at some specific results. There's a lot of information here. Let's go through this step by step. So these are gaps created in a hardwood forest in, in Wisconsin. These are experimentally created gaps, right? And these are decay rates. So let me explain this. We have, again, these stakes were placed in 2010. We collected in 2012, 14, 16, and 18. These are color-coded, so the blue matches the gap, right? And the green, the intact canopy. And what we see for both aspen and maple, that after two years, there's greater mass loss, that is more rapid decomposition, um, in the gaps when compared to the intact canopy. So after two years, we were quite happy about this. We saw a result. We were worried that it was just an anomaly. 
But that same difference persisted at year four, six, and eight. So there seems to be a clear difference in decay rates under gaps when compared to the intact canopy, right? So there's been, as you folks know, decades of work on tree fall gaps and the vegetation response. Here we're looking at a, process, a change in process, right? Um, other people have looked at leaf litter decomposition in gaps here. I think we're the first to look at wood decomposition in gaps. And these results are nicely corroborated with work Jody Forrester has done. So this is um, CO2 flux. So we put CO2 collars on decayed logs and monitor the flux rate from those logs, right? So more CO2 flux, more decomposition. And what you see over time, this is just one year's data, the gaps have greater CO2 flux. The logs in the gaps have greater CO2 flux than the logs under and kept intact canopy. So this really nicely corroborates our work using decay stakes. So that's a real nice data set, pretty clear results. But as it turns out, there's an enormous amount of variability in decay rate. So this is a picture I hope demonstrates that very well. These are two aspen stakes here, and believe it or not, here. They're placed at exactly the same time, literally probably within a minute of each other, or seconds, right? They've been there the same amount of time. This one's relatively intact. This one's pretty much gone except for a sliver here. So the reason for that, I'm not going to go into the de details. We've actually done um, DNA analyses on the fungal communities um, decomposing these. There's a huge difference in the fungal communities. And one of these stakes can have as many as 30 fungal operational taxonomic units, or think of them as species, right? So the composition at fungal community has a lot to do with the decay rate. Some fungal species are very aggressive decayers, de decomposers. Some are weaker, right? So depending on what spores colonize those stakes, um, that determines the decay rate. So changing topics a bit, if we look at another influential paper, 2015, Moroni and others, they found that much of the deadwood in our northern temperate and boreal forests is actually covered with moss. They refer to that as burial. And they determined that the logs that become covered are effectively preserved, right? Um, so I see how much time I have left. I'm going to skip the next slide. So we, right, our idea was that those logs are not being tallied in most inventories of coarse woody debris. So they're sort of the missing carbon pool. So we wrote a series of proposals to study this. And I was going to go through these one at a time, but it's rather embarrassing. The point is, they were all rejected. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so what do you do? So we resort to a hobby project of mine where at the Howland Forest in Maine, I've got triplets, believe it or not, triplets of these stakes placed at 48 locations along a wetland gradient, right? So this stake I'm keeping, the mo if moss colonizes it, I clip it free. This one I allow to be colonized by mosses. And this we inserted under the moss with a serrated bread knife, right? So I think you see, without going into details about the research questions, I think you can see where we're headed with this. And so coming back to my initial question, understanding woody debris dy dynamics is important in the understanding the forest carbon cycle. Questions? I've got, I've got a few minutes left. I thought those numbers were for the 20 minute. I could, okay, I got it. Okay, plenty of time for questions. Pete. <laughs> Well, it's only 2,000 stakes, yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you testing any elevated off the ground? So, on, yeah, good question. On this site, we are monitoring moisture. We, we think that's the biggest driver here on this site.